Hello, my name is Julia Andrews Clifford. I'm the Young Film Programmers Network Manager Southeast, and I'm introducing this afternoon's BFI Film Academy Lab on the subject today, which is programming archive films. Thanks for joining us. Um, these BFI Film Academy Labs are designed for 16 to 25 year olds to get professional advice, learn from the insider's view of what people working in industry know to help develop their filmmaking and film programming practices. And these sessions are online, which is great because it's freezing out there and um, this stormy, cold February. Thank you for joining us. Um, a little bit about me, I am, my pronouns are she or her. I am a white middle-aged woman with long brown hair and I'm wearing purple glasses. And I'd like to introduce Simon today, but he's not quite with us yet. So I'm actually going to introduce Alessia Mavakala, who is our Young Film Programmer presenter today, who's going to be doing the interview section of today's session. Hi, Alessia. How are you? Hello, Julia. Uh, I'm, I'm doing very good. Thank you so much for um, inviting me here. I'm really happy to be talking with Simon today and uh, with you as well. So for people who don't know, um, uh, my name is Alessia. I've been pronounced as she, her. And uh, I work for Bali Cars. I'm a project manager. And uh, we do organize projects for young people, film events, and uh, traveling projects as well and we also do have a film festival called Taste of Anatolia that brings Turkish cinema to the UK and uh, a few friends and I recently started a, a journal an online journal that's dedicated to radically progressive forms of art like poetry writing visual art so really anything anything creative amazing and so it's like it's really exciting to have you hosting the session today because you have just started out as a film programmer, but you are a filmmaker and an actor and a writer. And so it's actually, you're the perfect person just starting out in film programming, not necessarily knowing that much about archive, even though I think you do know a little bit actually, um, to actually find out about what sometimes feels quite a mysterious and hard to access area of film programming. Can you tell us a little bit about when whatever you've ever experienced in terms of archive before. Uh, yeah, so there was a film competition a few years ago. I think it was during lockdown, I believe. And you basically had access to a old film archive and you could like, you had to like create a short film with that. So I joined and uh, it was a really fun experience to go through old cinema, uh, old videos that you might never have access to or you might never have the opportunity to see like on mainstream cinema or mainstream platforms. Yeah, so, so actually, even though you haven't directly done sort of film, film program with archive films, you've actually done a fair bit and you've got a sense of what the field is about. So uh, it's really great to have you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so the way today's session is gonna run is when we get Simon, we're gonna have half an hour, which is Alessia posing her questions to him. And then at five o'clock, that's when we're gonna hand it over to you. So there's the Q&A function. We'd like you to put your questions in the Q&A, not the chat, please. And as soon as it gets to five o'clock, we're gonna hit him with your questions. So put them in whenever you feel like it, whenever they come up, and we hope we're gonna get all of them answered. So we're gonna start um, by introducing Simon. Uh, I think he has, disappeared. So I'm going to explain what Simon does at BFI, a little bit about his background, and then we'll watch a short uh, clip from something that he's been working on recently. Um, so Simon McCallum is the BFI Archive Projects Curator, and part of this is he works across BFI digital platforms, and he programmes archive films for film festivals, and for seasons and events at BFI South Bank in London. So he will talk about how he got to where he is today and that Leslie is gonna be probing him on his career journey. But a little bit about the role he's in at the moment. Um, some of the events that he's done, you might have heard of are, there was a season called To the Ends of the Earth, Exploration and Endurance on Film. Uh, and he also 
program, Gross Indecency, Queer Lives Before and After the 67 Act. So his main job in BFI Archive was also related to setting up the media techs across the UK and also working with the BFI iPlayer. So even if you're not interested in programming archive films, you might be interested in thinking about creating your own archive and your own iPlayer. So that sort of uh, digital experience, we hope when he comes, will be really great to hear from him. Um, in addition to his BFI work, he works as an archive consultant on feature and documentary films. And uh, recently in 2017, he was the archive consultant on Queer Armour, which was a documentary about the lesbian and gay experience over the last hundred years which is essentially a montage of archive. More recently, and soon to be released by BFI in June, very exciting film called Arcadia, which is a folk horror film, essentially wrapped up in archive with soundtrack produced by Portishead and Goldfrapp. So it also shows how archive is something with, when it's silent, the way you can create a music event with it is something really exciting for filmmakers and festivals to think about. And very, very recently, he's been working on the UK project called Unboxed, which is about creativity in the UK, and it's link linking archive with immersive um, virtual reality and augmented reality. So I think he'll probably talk about that in a little while. And I think he's here. So um, we... Can you we hear me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. The power of digital to not technology. We have finally got you here. Um, we were just about to show, Simon, a little bit from Arcadia, just to, so to give you a moment to settle in, if that's all Perfect. right. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. That was one of those Zoom gremlin horrendous <laughs> moments where we were scrambling yes get another laptop so i'm very sorry to everybody don't be You're here. it's really it's really great to have you thank you so much for coming today oh my and, pleasure thank you for having me and um we'll get we'll get to alessia's questions quickly sure. but let's let's yeah. watch that clip okay. just to so, so you can relax and of then course. when we finish the clip Three. i'll hand over to alessia yeah This is the Britain we have all inherited. A land of incomparable beauty. Amazing. I, bet, I, I love the way it starts as what you think is an ordinary, you know, what you would, pre, you know, your preconceptions about what an archive film would be. And then yes, it suddenly yeah. just Oldie, shifts. Oldie, yeah, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Brilliant. So thank you so much for coming. I'm going to introduce you to Alessia, who's our young film <laughs> programmer presenter today. Uh, a little bit about Alessia, project manager at Ballack Arts in Cambridge. She's also studying film and television at Anglia Ruskin University. 
And she also let us know that she did once do the um, University of East Anglia mashup archive competition, but she didn't win, so she erased it from her brain. So yeah. but hopefully it'll come back a little bit today. So without further ado, and just to say, Alessia, we've got an extra 10 minutes, so don't rush your questions. I'd like sure, to thank you over. Thank um, you. Simon, it's so amazing to have you today, and uh, I have um, a few questions for you, especially about your job as an archive project curator, and uh, mostly because I don't know a lot about this job, I've never really heard about it before, so I wanted to ask you if, in a few words, can you tell us what is the role of the an archive project curator? Sure thing, yeah, and thank, thanks for having me. Um, I suppose, in a nutshell, my job's really about getting the archive out there to audiences. So I have colleagues that are much more hands-on archivists and will preserve and digitize and look after the physical objects in the archive, whether that's film or videotape. But my job's really about once things are digitized and digitally available, is getting them out there. So this could be in a multitude of ways. It could be programming for our digital platforms so I've done a lot of work for BFI Player online, curating themed archive collections. Also in venue for our media tech at BFI South Bank, um, where we can make a lot more available because of rights. And we'll, I think we're going to get on to, to rights, the fun, the fun topic a bit later. Um, but I also now do quite a lot of work with production companies and filmmakers who want to creatively reuse archives. So the, the example you just saw, Arcadia, was it was a feature documentary we worked on a couple of years back that really emerged out of the digitization work we've been doing of, of representations of the countryside and rural life and it was sort of spinning that on its head a bit and giving it a bit of a dark take about what we're doing to the natural world so yeah, that's really interesting yeah creative reuse so, and then i also did a little bit of programming sit film seasons using archive in in venue bfi south bank i've also done events at the barbican sort of one-off events as well as longer seasons so so i sort of cover a few a few different bases sort of both online and in venue and in the sort of broadcast realm yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Sorry, that wasn't a very quick answer to your question. <laughs> no, I wanted. I, I really wanted a real, a really quick answer. So that's that's perfect. That's perfectly fine. And also, you mentioned a lot of people. So you mentioned colleagues and like films, film yeah. events. So the way I imagined it, it was that it was a very lonely job by yourself. So what other roles? What other job roles are out there? It can be, but it it sort of relies on a massive team of people to to mm -hmm. make what I do possible. So we have a curatorial team at the BFI National Archive that's, that's quite large, it's sort of 20 to 30 people. And so we have real specialists in particular areas of the collection that I work with and that will advise. Um, people that are experts in silent cinema, in animation, in documentary film, in fiction, narrative film, um, an artist film curator. So we have this sort of broader curatorial team that are sort of experts in the collection. And so I tend to have, I work across the different collections. Um, so we work with them and also with um, more technical colleagues at the archive who are actually looking after the physical collections, which are really vast and will coordinate these big digitization projects when we get funding for them, which is it's obviously yeah. very expensive. And then there's sort of venue staff at the BFI South Bank if we're putting on a film show or a season, a sort of theme season that, that are integral to clearing all the rights to show things, to doing research into available prints, whether they're from us or from international archives. So a lot of this is about us collaborating with colleagues in archives both around the UK and around the world. And we should say that although the BFI looks after the national, moving image collection, which is about a million film and TV titles. We also work with a whole network around the UK of regional and national archives. So, so there's a lot of, of sort of cooperation and collaboration. Um, it's not just about sort of our collection, as great as it is. So it's a lot of collaboration in the archive world goes on. And I think if you're interested in getting into that, you know, there's a lot of places that you can go to for information and that um, 
you know, if there aren't, isn't an opportunity available at the BFI, it's great to familiarise yourself with with the kind of landscape of archives in the UK. Yes, yeah, that's definitely, yeah. And also wanted to ask, because uh, when, for example, when you look for jobs online, you're looking for a new job, you're looking for a new place, you don't often hear about um, archive content curator or like archive film programmer. So I wanted to ask, how did you find this job position and also how did you get it? Sure. Well, I, I don't know how far back you want me to go, but I'll sort of try and summarise. So I was always really, really interested in history, particularly sort of 20th century history. And I studied that at school um, and to, sort of to A-level. And then as I was sort of doing my A-levels, I was getting more and more into film. So I wanted to sort of marry the historical interest with my interest in, in sort of cinema, really. Um, and so I ended up doing an undergrad in film and English at, at UEA, University of East Anglia in Norwich, which had a really, really good film department. And then sort of from there, I learned that they did this master's course that was quite pioneering in its day. It was the only one of its kind yeah. when it started that was to give you a sort of grounding in film archiving. So I sort of ended up going back to UEA a couple of years later to do, to do this course. Mm -hmm. You know, there weren't many places on it, so I, I didn't get in the first year. I reapplied. I luckily got a sort of grant to support me doing it um, because it was considered a sort of vocational thing. Um, and several of my now colleagues at the BFI did the same course, um, which now doesn't exist, unfortunately. And access to kind of specialist courses is a real issue in this area about how people get there start so I did the MA course that was a bit of a grounding in the practical elements of film handling and preservation and um, film storage but also in terms of starting to think about programming archive and we would do practice film shows you know curating film shows that kind of thing a lot of creative stuff yeah, yeah. so that's, so, the, that's yeah. the route that I sort of ended up going in and I got to do a we had to do a placement in an archive and I was lucky enough to to get a placement at Francis Ford Coppola's production company in San oh. Francisco, called, which is called American Zoetrope, because I'd had a tip off that they were ready to accept like an archive intern. So I started the course and was like, that's what I wanted, that's where I want to go for my placement. And so I sort of made it happen. Um, and so got to kind of go behind the scenes at a working sort of production company, which they sometimes do have their own archives. That's something to bear in mind. It's not just about these big institutional archives like the BFI. There are often film studios and film companies that, that will have archive staff looking after their sort of own library of materials and collections. So, yeah. um, so that's there. And then I did a job, sorry, this is probably too much information, but I'm just giving you the sort of path to where I got to. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then I did a year uh, cataloguing historical archive footage, a uh, company called Footage Farm in London. Um, and from there, I joined the BFI when they, they were launching their first MediaTek in about 2005. I joined the BFI. Um, and it was the combination of, of sort of history going into the archive, surfacing it and actually making it available digitally for the first time. A lot of this material was really exciting. And so I was curating kind of themed collections for, for this particular resource that we still have at the South Bank. So, okay. sorry, that was yeah. again a long, a long <laughs> answer to your question. And uh, also because you mentioned that you were really interested in history mm -hmm. and now you're, do, like, now you're an archive project director. So I wanted to ask, was this your childhood dream to become, to have this job position? Like when, when people, when you were young and people were asking you, what do you want to be when you grow older? Was this the answer you was giving them or? I wanted to be an architect when I was little because I liked houses and I liked drawing houses and buildings. I was obsessed with buildings. And then, but then that took on a sort of historical element too about sort of researching different styles of architecture. And then I got more and more into film and TV. And it's important to say that we look after a huge collection of television. It's not just about but cinema, it's not just about feature films. So I think when you're thinking about archive programming, don't forget about telly. Telly comes with its own challenges when you're programming because of the rights and the clearance issues. So I'm not gonna lie, it can be complex, but 
I, I quite like to mix up film and TV, mix genres, mix time periods. I, I don't I don't like to stick to this kind of very traditional way of programming. Yes. Okay. Um, so is this sort of like a creative job or is it more like boring at your laptop? I think you'll find most jobs, a big chunk of it is sitting at your computer, writing emails, calling people, the, 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 the drudgery. Of, there's a drudgery element of every job. So I have great things in my job that I get to do, but I also have the practical <laughs> admin stuff. And there's never, because archives are never well resourced enough ever, even big ones, there's never enough support. You usually have to do a lot of things yourself. So, you know, I might actually be manually entering data into a content management system for one of our platforms. I might be taking image grabs for films we're publishing on BFI Player, if I've chosen that film to be digitized. But that obviously has a creative element as well. But you have to remember all of these sorts of slightly mundane tasks actually often do have an element of curation and that you are making a choice as to what is presented to the public. So even if that's just you choosing which frame is going to be the thumbnail image for mm -hmm. a film that you're publishing online, okay. that is an act of curation in a way. It's sort of your, you're choosing how that film is going to be represented. And writing is a big part of my job. So this is something writing skills are really important in terms of film curation, whether you're writing about archive or contemporary film. You know, I would really recommend everyone practices their writing skills and practices writing very concisely about film and not just describing film. So there's a creative part of the job there, which I, I often, you know, is quite an important part for me, which is, is writing about the films that we're presenting in, in whatever way, whether that's on a cinema screen, you know, or on a, you know, on a collection online. So. So yeah, you're, you seem like a very creative person. You're writing, you do this job. So what is, like, can you give us an example of a project you're very proud of? Like your, your proudest moment? Oh, that's, ex that's a tricky one. I possibly would say there was, there was another film I worked in called Queer Armour, which was a little bit similar to Arcadian, that it was a sort of collage film um drawing on the history of lgbtq plus sort of representation in in film and tv in britain and so we worked with a filmmaker called daisy asquith who who had sort of applied to our bfi film fund for funding to make this film and it actually turned into this amazing kind of collaborative experience because i'd already done loads of work um, Kind of researching and curating our collections that relate to kind of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer experience and sort of how that appears in the archive, you know, for better and for worse. So it's not not just about positive representation, but sort of really tracing the evolution of that. So I'd done quite a lot of work in this area already. And so that meant that we were able to kind of hit the ground running. I, I sort of was acting as almost like an archive consultant on the production. BFI was partly funding it, BBC also put money in. And we actually got that made in three months, which is very unusual for a feature yeah. documentary. And it had to be ready because we actually premiered it at the Sheffield Doc Fest um, in the June. So it had to be ready because Daisy was invited to be the opening night film. So we had this incredibly sort of prestigious opportunity to, to showcase the film, so it sort of had to be done. And she'd been working with the musician John Grant, who, who lent some of his music to the film as well, and he performed at the opening night. So I think that was a really proud moment, to sit in the town hall in Sheffield and to sort of see the results of so much hard work yeah it's, it's, so, it's a lot it's a lot yeah it's, it's really like um like inspiring so like definitely like they would like getting to that point and also seeing like the hard work you put into a project so what would you say to a young person who, want, who also wants to get in programming like mm -hmm. what are some simple ways to get into that and also like achieve and like get that like recognition for their hard work 
I would say start small and actually start make make things happen yourself. I, I would say start even if it's start a blog, start your own YouTube channel with your own kind of like your own films, your own film reviews, your own kind of somehow get your perspective out there. I think and that is then going to help you get your point of view out there about film, whether it's archive or otherwise. And I think that is always going to help you when you come to see a job that you fancy, that you spot and you're like, that sounds interesting. You're going to be asked to sort of demonstrate your passion and your interest. And I think it doesn't mean you necessarily have to do loads of work for free. I don't think we should be asking people to do that. But, but start something yourself on a sort of grassroots level, whether that's your own writing, your own online blog, your own vlog, your own social media channel, something that you could that represent you and I didn't really sort of have that at the time I kind of was starting out I didn't sort of have those platforms available because I'm an, I'm old uh, or I'm <laughs> relatively old so you know I, I think it's got much more competitive now not that it wasn't in my day but mm -hmm. you have to sort of somehow stand out from the crowd so I think try and try and work on something that's going to represent your point of view on film, on cinema, in whatever platform, whatever form that takes, really. Yeah, so yeah because there are a lot of platforms like Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, like, where you can find like so many different opportunities, so many things that can help your career grow. Um, and also like about art, I feel like it seems like a very old, like, Thing, like something about the past so how would you push like I don't know young people young generation to watch archive films because there are some hidden gems that you might not ever see at like your local cinema or like at the theater yeah. yeah I mean I would just say don't don't discount it because almost everything is archive you know something that somebody made last year could be archive do you know what I mean like it's it don't see it as this ancient thing and I would also say that it, it brings history to life in a way that I think as great as still photography is and other media, I think moving image is, is the best thing to bring history to life for people. And it's actually quite recent history. So you may think the Victorians, you know, the birth of cinema in the late 1800s, you may think that's ancient history, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not ancient history at all. There's a lot more in common with those people you're seeing. So you need to sort of look past the antiquated clothes and the old cars and the old, you know, buildings, whatever. Don't be put off by that. Because if you start to look for the people and the life in these films, you will realize that there's a lot more, there's a lot more connection there than you might imagine. And I'd also say that um, I just think archive can teach us a lot about ourselves. And you have to remember that we're not on this sort of upward trajectory. You know, the, the Victorians were way back there, completely different to us, and we're suddenly way better. Things don't just improve like this, okay? It's like that. So we're, we're not on this kind of clear line of progress. And I think what's going on in the world, you know, recently, you, it reminds you that history repeats itself. And so Afghanistan, oh. Ukraine, don't don't disconnect kind of what's happening in the world to what you're seeing in old film. I think it can sort of teach us quite a lot actually about who we are and how our attitudes have changed or actually not changed very much. So yeah, I was I was also looking through the BFI archive and I was looking through the Black in Britain film and there was this lovely film uh, called Jemina and Johnny oh, yeah. about this friendship that. between like uh, a black girl and a white boy and yeah, like, yeah. sort of like it, it was for me like a throwback into my childhood because in my in my living room when I was back in Italy there was like this picture of me and this and this boy like we were like best friends. But like, I don't have any contact with this person. I don't know where he's gone. And we had these dolls, like we were both holding dolls sitting on this like green sofa. So it was really like a nice throwback into like the past, into my past. And also the types of shots, it has those cinema that were showing every action they were doing, going around places around England. So I think it can also be a really nice way to explore your past and like see yourself in like, those characters who belong to the past somehow. 
Exactly. And that's that's connected you back with your own story. So, I mean, that just shows you how powerful that film that was made in the 60s. And that's also was speaking about a time when there was all this racial unrest and racism going on in and that's set in Notting Hill, that film. And obviously that conversation is still bubbling along and is still relevant about racial equality. And that was made by a filmmaker called Lionel Ngarkane, who was a South African anti-apartheid activist who kind of came over and was exiled over here. So there's a whole story to sort of the filmmaker very often, as well as the actual what you're seeing on, on the screen. It's the story of the people that were making it. It's often fascinating. And although, yes, Notting Hill isn't like that anymore, there's things that the film is saying that's still really relevant. So that's an interesting, interesting one. Um, and just that you've picked that out as something that means something to you is, mm -hmm. is a perfect example of how you could program a film in a sort of contemporary perspective. Yeah, and also like if I, because I'm thinking like if I want to show any of these films to like friends and we're screening maybe at uni or mm -hmm. an event, how do I even get the rights just to share this film? You know, because so, sometimes it's hard to like get in contact yeah. with like the producers, writers, directors, and especially because these films are old. So how, yeah. how do I do that? This is the really tough thing. I mean, we put as much as we can onto BFI Player for free. We've we've put lots of films on there, but the issue with film screenings in a venue is that that then requires a totally different level of, of clearance. And so that's where it does become complicated. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, we have a distribution and bookings team at the BFI, and you can always phone them up or email them and ask for some advice. Like if you've spotted something you really want to screen, you know, they're always happy to hear from people and they have a whole catalogue of films that they can suggest to you. If you're if you're thinking about programming a particular theme season or an event, they will have things that are going to be more easy to clear for screenings. Um, but what, so what I would say is if you're sort of do immerse yourself in the available resources. So BFI Player, there's 10,000 free films from us and our partner archives, of which you found the, the Black Britain collection, which has got some amazing, amazing stuff in. So use that as sort of inspiration and immerse yourself in it. And certainly if you have specific titles that you're interested in, you can contact the relevant archive, whether it's BFI or Yorkshire Film Archive, whoever it may be. Um, and they have their logos on if it's not from the BFI. So you should be able to see which archive it's come from. And can I ask you like uh, one like last question about this? Like, what are you working at the moment? Like, is there any projects that is in the background that you want to share with us? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of things. So I'm, I've executive produced a feature doc using an amazing collection that we have in the archive that's coming out in the summer. So can't say anything else about that now, so that's not very helpful. But that that's been a really exciting thing to work on, and and we'll share more about that when it when it's kind of announced. But there's another one that's quite exciting that relates to this big festival called Unboxed, which is running around the country this summer. Now, Unboxed is a sort of series of ten big commissions that are about sort of celebrating creativity. Um, around the UK, so it's a government funded big project. The BFI's project is, is called Story Trails, and so that's using archive in immersive ways. So there'll be a series of augmented reality trails using your smartphone that will be in particular towns around the UK in the summer, sort of touring, alongside a set of, of VR, virtual reality experiences. And so this is quite new territory using archive film in immersive context, because it hasn't really been done that much yet. So although VR isn't a new thing, mm -hmm. archive doesn't hasn't really been explored that much in a sort of immersive sense. So so that's that's the sort of current thing that I'm working on that's quite new territory for, for all of us. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, you know, over the summer. Yeah, thank you. It was really interesting. Great to hear about that. So it's definitely looking forward to it. And uh, also, uh, if anyone has any questions. Yeah. 
And, and so we, there are a couple of questions. Um, um, amazing, really fascinating stuff then. So great also to hear, Alessia, your sort of experience and what has touched you in the archive. Yeah, that's, um, we want to hear this as well. That's useful for us as well. Yeah, yeah. And um, so we've got a couple of questions, but just to say to everyone, put your questions in the Q&A now, not the chat, please, and we'll get to them. Um, I'm going to quickly squeeze one in. So in terms of researching, so if you're a filmmaker, you're a young filmmaker or a young programmer. So Alessia, you came across that film. How did you come across it is the question to you. And Simon, are there some lists or a place you can find those ICO packages as a starting point? Because and what did you say, 10 million? Uh, there's so much content out there. We've How can million, you whittle it down? Yeah, yeah we've got a mi about roughly a million moving image titles in the archive, plus loads of papers and stills and posters and everything. So there's all the special collection stuff as well. But um, remember, m much of that isn't digitized yet. And so because it's such a big, expensive task, if you think something like Britain on Film, which is the project that when you look on the free collections on BFI Player, that's the sort of output of it, including the Black Britain collection, multiple other themed ones, that's only 10,000, 5,000 are from us. So it's yeah. not our archive. So there's, there's a whole raft of material that's waiting to be digitized that isn't as easily accessible, but you can in some cases come in and do research viewings. The media tech at the South Bank has about 100,000. So if you're in London, able to get to London, that's an amazing research tool as well. So yeah. I suppose what I'm saying is those numbers could be just completely dazzling and yeah. you're sort of drowning in it. So that yeah. it's like pointing, and maybe we can put in the chat some of those. I know that Independent Cinema Office, where Young Film Programmers Network Southeast is based, has yeah. done events with packages. Yes, and that's been really a them. helpful steer. Yeah. And that's quite a good starting point. We, we worked with them when we were rolling out the Britain on Film collections to do these sort of curated packages that are sort of bookable. So if you wanted as a sort of starting point to put on an archive screening, there are in some cases these sort of ready-made packages where it's all cleared for you. It's all ready to go, contextualised and everything. And there, there are collections that, that kind of go with some of the thematic collections on BFI Player. So yeah. there are starting points. There's way more access points than there used to be. You know, you've got so much more online to, to explore, lots more in venue. There's the BFI Library is an amazing resource for research as well. So I'm going to go then to Alessia. So how did you stumble upon, upon it? Uh, so did, you, was, did you watch thousands and thousands? Or uh, what so I was on the BFI uh, archive website and I was just looking through like the different films and I had like black in Britain because I was I'm, I'm black but I wasn't raised in, in, in England so I was like okay let's find out more about it and there was these two child two, these two children so I just clicked on it and I found yeah, that was the image it was the yeah. image that made you click on that then. Yes. That's quite interesting. Brilliant. So thank you. So obviously, you know, you, you need some starting place, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, unless you are a film archivist. But even then, probably, as you said, all those different genres. But I, we've got to stop talking. We've got to go to the uh, Q&A. But um, that, on that note, uh, there's a question from Georgia Skells. What do you look for when you're grabbing stills, like for thumbnails? Is there a criteria or is it more of an intuitive choice? So obviously they're really important, those stills. Yeah, I mean, it's, and this goes for all of our platforms. I mean, I, my, my sort of baby originally was the MediaTek when we first launched that one, when I was first starting in. A big part of that was the visuals about grabbing people. And it was about curating in a way that appealed to people that weren't necessarily cinephiles or very knowledgeable about film. It was more about accessible subjects and interests and themes and also making it visually compelling and making people want to click on that rather than that. Mm -hmm. So thumbnails and imagery has always been a really important part of, of what I do, although it seems sort of superficial, it's important. Mm -hmm. So it is intuitive to me, and I tend, I tend to go for primarily for faces and for people to give that sense of life and engagement. Yeah. Occasionally something very graphic as well that works with particular artist films and things. Yeah. But it's intuitive. I think you know you you scroll through something and you you you'll yeah. know what the right, yeah. the right and, moment is. Yeah, and I guess Alessia, that must be interesting in your programming and advertising things 
it's just something maybe that comes with experience. I don't know. Do you do you do any of that sort of thing for Bali Cars? Uh, so at Bali Cars now we have a, a group of like young film programmers. So we've been having like sessions weekly, like twice a week actually. And uh, we want we are, we are organizing a film a film screening so a film screening sorry, and uh, we're gonna see the film Papi Cha so it's a film by an Algerian Algerian filmmaker it's about women empowerment it's about fashion so um, yeah it's it's really interesting also because of the thing that you said before for example that you, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to get the rights but if you get in contact with the right people you can get it so it was it was really like open like eye-opening for me to find out that we can actually uh, screen this film so yeah it's definitely really really good yeah rights right. is rights is the perennial challenge with any film screening whether it's sort of an archive title or not and it's sort of it is as you say finding finding your way to the right person you've just got to be persistent sometimes and yeah maybe it's the i yeah, would the just pa- say on, on, on festival i mean if you imagine a fe- film festival you're scrolling through how important imagery is you just whiz past something because there's so much. So it's about grabbing, grabbing people and the one line, you know, if you've got a one line teaser bit of text. Yeah, so it's yeah. not about necessarily reams of copy. It's mm-hmm. about grabbing, grabbing yeah. people. Yeah. So there's a question from an on- anonymous attendee. Question for Simon. What are some of the things you can do to ensure your work exhibiting the archive reaches a larger number of people, including young audiences? and audiences outside the usual cultural institutions. Yeah, definitely. And I think I think it's surfacing archive titles that actually speak to those audiences. I don't think we we have to approach everything in the same very traditional way. Yes, we do have a massive audience for our train films, for instance, and there's nothing wrong with that. So so for instance on our our DVD and Blu-ray label, some of the top sellers are the British transport films, which are beautiful. But I think we, you do need to start surfacing things that are, are more relevant to a kind of younger audience. So for instance, I mean, just off top of head, so in the Black Britain collection, for instance, there's this incredible, incredible film called Divide and Rule Never, which is all about the whole sort of rock against racism movement in the 70s. And so although it's a 50 year old film, it was made by youth kind of collective, filmmaking collective. It brought together kind of black, Asian and white teenagers talking about how they were sort of banding together against racism, you know, around the UK, particularly London, that one. But it sort of does, I think it does reference other parts of the UK as well. So I think a film like that, although it's 50 years old, that's that's quite a long time ago. I think it has so much to say about you know, where we're at now and the conversations we're having now. And also that sense of solidarity, I think would really speak to, to kind of younger audiences. So that's literally like a random off top of head example. I think there are things in the archive that you can surface that will speak to a slightly, a slightly different audience. If that yeah. Makes sense. And uh, one, actually, what is it, White Riot? Um, but one of our young programmer groups screened that uh, yeah. during lockdown and had a Q&A around it. So obviously adding Q&A as well can help. We've run projects where we've got funding from Film Hub North and they've done more of a, you know, eventized thing around yes. it or done a yeah. short. Are there, are, you know, quickly getting in there. So are there any specific other kind of um, event types that are a way of, gently introducing archive to yeah. new audiences. I mean, can you pair, you know, can you pair an archive short with a contemporary feature, for instance? So, I mean, I am just trying to think of an example of something I did recently. I mean, that's not really... I well, we, just... ha- we, we had a project actually that did exactly that. Yeah. And so I think it was like they had um, a short called Lost Connections, which oh, was yes. all about the pandemic. Yeah. And they paired, and five of the venues paired them with a different uh feature which was related to mental health yeah and I th- exactly. um, the one off the top of my head was spencer there was one um another one was little miss sunshine they Interesting. Did. So, yeah yeah you know, but so yeah it was and then they had a speaker so that it pairing... goes to show the themes that they found you know and the, the films in lost connections from the the regional kind of partner archives you know those aren't about mental health per se but they've sort of brought them together to tell a bit of a story that will connect with people now 
Um, and also if you're doing programming for an event, don't, don't feel like if, if you feel like a, an archive feature isn't going to work or isn't clearable, think about short films. You know, there's a wealth of short archive, yeah. archive film that's, that is easily clearable without copyright or, you know, I know it yeah. can seem overwhelming. If it's a silent film, can you get a musician to do a live performance? You know, that's yeah. something that we do a lot of. We've just, just um, remastered the film South, which is all about Ernest Shackleton's amazing endurance expedition and they're on they're trying to find his ship right now so oh, that's great. history yeah. right yeah. now great and this is a film from 19 you know shot in 1915 of the ship going down yeah and we've got neil brand to record a new score and, and so there's the also the, the silent cinema angle which yeah. can be more eventized with music um yeah i mean use, absolutely that arcadia you know the, yeah, the soundtrack using, is crucial using to... contemporary music that that was two guys from porter's head and um goldfrack I think. goldfrack so mm. you know they're, they're they're kind of well-known musicians that yeah. contributed that so it's it's it, that's adding yeah. another contemporary layer yeah exciting i we've got some questions i'm going to go to them so um anonymous attendee how much freedom do you have in what you program at the VFI? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I would say I have a, a, a reasonable amount of freedom. There are certain projects that are sort of decided on a, a higher level and we all, all, you know, some of us have to sort of work on and deliver. But for instance, the season I did last month, I programmed at VFI South Bank, which was called To the Ends of the Earth. That was tying in with this centenary of Shackleton's death and the end of heroic age of Antarctic exploration. And that was something that I essentially just pitched to colleagues about two years ago. But nobody said, you have to do this. So I sort of made that happen. And so a lot of my job has sort mm -hmm. of been me, me carving out a niche and actually making things happen. Yeah. And so in that sense, I do have a reasonable amount of freedom. It doesn't mean every time you say, I want to do a season and they're going to say fine go for it but they will sometimes so you have to come up with the ideas you know you don't yeah. just necessarily stick to what's very strictly in your job spec so I think there's an element once you get your foot in the door you know you you can carve out a bit of a niche with your own initiative so does that answer I'm not sure that I, answers your question I think it I think it does it's good and and um this is a follow-up to that from Miranda Bentley. What would be some advice for a way to start a career within archive, programming and curating film? And this quote, question is open to everyone, both guests and hosts. Sure I mean, I've, when, when we spoke... I mean, I've blabbered, but... <laughs> well, you know, passion and persistence yes, seems we, to be the way. It's, yeah. yeah, don't take no for an answer. Um, Think about, you know, if you, you know, if there isn't an opening at the current time at the BFI, you know, is there a, do you, are you in Yorkshire, does the Yorkshire Film Archive have any opportunities? Does the, you know, does, does the Welsh Archive need some help? You know, I, I certainly, I, I, I certainly don't want to push people to sort of volunteering if they're not, don't have the means to do that. Um, but get to know your local archive, get to know what they have available, um, build those relationships look out for local screenings in your area that, that have an archive element to them, go along to them, introduce yourself to the person presenting or to the programmer at the cinema, you know, start to have those conversations. I know it's nerve wracking, but it start to kind of make those connections, I would say. And what do you think, Alessia? Uh, so I should definitely text people, send messages, being like, oh, I, I'm actually looking for this job. Do you know anyone? Or uh, sometimes people are not, sometimes, sometimes people don't even put announcements. Sometimes people don't even know that they need you. So just have that confidence to send a message, send that email. Because for example, like the journal that my friends and I started, uh, we just had a new girl who joined us and uh, we didn't put any announcement that we needed a new person. Well, she just sent an email be like, I'm really interested that would love to join and we just said yes so it's like it's actually like sometimes it's like all about like believing in yourself and putting yourself out there so yeah and so I mean you got the job as project manager at Ballack Arts how did that come about 
Um, so <laughs> I was in the Cambridge Filmmakers group chat and uh, uh, Yashin, who is the founder of uh, Bali Cards, she uh, promoted a project uh, in a, a, a project in Turkey. So I really like traveling. So uh, I tried to apply, but then lockdown pandemic 2020. So it didn't happen. But I started following the Bali Cards uh, page and uh, she announced a a, like job position so I didn't apply initially because I I didn't like my CV so I like waited like weeks before doing that but then I ended up applying and she goes like yeah and that's how I started <laughs> <laughs> well that was lucky I would say um that to avoid serendipity, perfectionism yeah, yeah or yeah, serendipity. part of it is right place right time is what you know there is luck comes into bits it's persistence it's you know you were obviously the right person at the right time there so it's yeah. kind of, you know, you, you can make things happen for yourself. Yeah. I would just try and have a backup of some kind of like platform for yourself to have a bit of a voice that you can share with people. And don't be afraid to phone people because emails are easy to ignore, as we all know, <laughs> or not ignore, but just they get lost. Don't underestimate the volume of emails people are getting in organisations. Yeah. And it's sometimes just not yeah. possible to respond. So. Yeah. Ring so, them up and hassle them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, we have a, a couple more questions we're going to get through. We've got Aditya um, asking, having just finished my bachelor's, I'm looking for a master's course where I can learn how to host film festivals. There doesn't seem to be any such courses. And even if there are, I have no idea what those courses are called. There's no information about right. this anywhere. And then how does get, one get a higher education in this field? if it's worth it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously your MA in archiving well, was that, worth it. That's that very was, specific. Yeah, I mean, I know that's a really unhelpful thing on one level because the course doesn't exist yeah. anymore, but that was quite specifically archiving. There was a curation programming element to it for sure, but it was sort of quite a broad introduction to, and I imagine the, 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 the people on this call and maybe not so much thinking about the very technical element of archive work, but I mean, shout if, if that is the case. Um, in terms of the sort of, when you say hosting a festival, do, do you mean, I think, do you mean sort of programming and curation for festivals? Because if that's the case, there are a couple of MAs. I think Birkbeck do an MA and I think it's either the London Film School, the National Film and Television School have collaborated on a, a postgrad in sort of curation and, and pro venue programming. Um, oh, Catherine's popped up in the chat. <laughs> yes, that is useful, Catherine, thank you. Mm. So, I mean, the ICO are great at pointing you to opportunities. So in terms of actual jobs in the industry, in, in archives and venues and festivals, but also in terms of training. So definitely keep an eye on the ICO's website and 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 kind of all the links that they have. It's kind of everything you ever wanted to know about starting a film festival that we're afraid to ask. Yeah. You know, and that and that counts for anything to do with programming independently. Because it is that. just like so that's where the place do you to start? Go. Yeah, it, yeah, I totally understand. It is a bit like where would you even start? And also if you're not don't have the resource to to kind of undertake an MA because it's obviously so expensive now yeah. I really feel you know yeah, I feel yeah, for people I understand yeah. the, the the challenge of yeah. this kind of thing so we're going to go we've got uh, one last question we're going to squeeze in another one from Georgia Skelt and what are your favorite projects that you've creatively used archive footage not necessarily that you've worked on Ooh. so that you oh, think yes. I think it means that you think have been creatively used okay I can think of one that's actually on Netflix. So strike, you know, strike me down. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Netflix, but like, I just mean this. I should probably be plugging BFI things, but there's a series called Wild Wild Country on Netflix, which I was just obsessed with for ages. It, it came out, and that's another thing I would say is if you have access to those sort of streaming platforms, there are amazing archive-based documentaries available on all of those, Amazon, all of them, as well as BFI Player. Um, Can I put in there? How yeah. do you find them though? Because when you look on the home screen, 
they seem to be invisible, but then people will give me a recommendation and I can find it. A lot of it. So where do you get well. the titles? Yeah, I mean, because you don't, you can't always tell, like, because they wouldn't, they often won't explicitly make it look archive because they think that's going to put people off. You know, this is the problem. Yeah, but yeah. That one was about this amazing cult that moved to Oregon in the States and set up this city. And the archive running through was mainly this sort of quite, quite rough old local new TV news footage that you would think was quite sort of esoteric, but actually it really helped to, because they had footage from the time of, of these people in this cult and this, or they wouldn't call themselves a cult, but <laughs> please watch it. And it weaves in contemporary interviews, animation. Mm. So it's weaving archive alongside other kind of forms. Yeah. It's incredible. Amazing. Oh my goodness. It's been a massive romp through. Um, we've run out of time and I don't want to cut it off, um, to get cut off too quickly. So on that note, obviously Sorry, when that's I knew- my fault for Zoom <laughs> not, at all. not at all. On our newsletter, we sent out some recommendations. So there was Under Sale in the Frozen North, you could try from BFI yeah. Player. Recommended that's from by the Simon. the Exploration Project last month, yeah. Yeah, there's Mr. Emmanuel about um, an, a Jew who goes into Nazi Germany to help someone and has a terrible time uh, feature. And then there's uh, an LGBTQ plus about Vauxhall Tavern, what, What's a Girl Like You, about drag acts, I, I in think the it's six, in the 60s. 1969, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we had and a couple of recommendations. We've had Jemima and Johnny from Alessia. And there was something else, Alessia, if you can get that. And oh, that was it. A short, yes. tall story, just yeah, and that's on the BFI free. Just quickly say something about that, and then we're going to have to go. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's basically an animated short film about these creatures. Some are very tall, and some are very uh, are very short, but they can never see each other because there's this big thick cloud that divides them. So like they start to hate each other, and then they try to like solve this issue by calling some creature, ma some magic creature. is is really nice. It's, it's a really good film. Yeah. I just don't want to. It's really, it's really great. Really and it's four minutes, so you know that's the sort of thing. Yeah, but, do explore player. There's so much yeah. free on there, all different yeah. genres, time periods, everything. Yeah, brilliant. We've run out of time. Thank you so much, and I've, I've mm -hmm. learned so much. If there will be, if there are any of the specific questions, we send an email out to everyone after, so um, we could get some of those links in there. And yeah. also, someone said, "Will it be recorded?" Yes, it is, and it will be on uh, ICO YouTube in a couple of weeks. So again, keep in touch with our web page and our newsletter, and you will be able to watch it all again and get those links. Thank you so much. Um, Alessia, brilliant to hear your experience. Will you be programming an archive film with Ballet Arts? <laughs> we, we can, now, that, now that I know that we can just get in contact and find out because where they feel like difficulties is trying to find out which films we can actually screen, but now yeah. that I have this information, definitely, why not? I'll just propose it to the team. <laughs> brilliant. And Simon, thank you so much for taking the time out. We'll all be looking out for Arcadia in the summer. Yes. Yeah, I oh know Arcadia's out there already. You can... Oh, I thought it was June. Oh, it was last no. year. I missed you know, a year. Arcadia, Arcadia's on there, <laughs> BFI DVD. Ah, brilliant. So, okay, I'm a year out of date with COVID, apologies. So yeah, check it out. Thank you so much. Have a great Thanks evening, everyone. Me. See you next Thank month. You. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.